Today, we're going to be covering the arguments of David Hume in his uh, very famous essay of miracles, and that will occupy us also for the final two lectures of the course next week. So without further ado, I'd like to move into that discussion. To incorporate Hume into a course on the deist controversy is itself to take a slightly controversial stance. We have the example of Leland, who includes Hume among the people that he analyzes in his view of the principal deistical writers. But as we'll see, there is some controversy as to whether the name properly belongs to Hume. Let's start by talking a little bit about the man himself. He was born in 1711 and died in 1776, the year of the American Revolution. He was a Scottish historian, philosopher, and diplomat. Today, he is widely regarded as the greatest philosopher who has ever written in the English language. That is not a sentiment universally shared, but it is certainly widespread, particularly in analytic philosophy circles. He left us three principal philosophical works. In 1739, he published A Treatise of Human Nature. He was 28 years old at the time, and this juvenile work of his, for which he had great hope, fell dead-born from the press. It excited no particular interest, few people took notice of it, and it did not succeed in the principal aim he had in writing it, which was to secure himself a lectureship at a university. And so he went into diplomacy and wrote essays and histories on the side. He wrote a multi-volume history of England, which I picked up at a used bookstore some time ago and put in the department library here. So if you want to see a physical copy of Hume's History of England, here it is in our department. You can come and peruse it at your leisure. In 1748, he published a work called Philosophical Essays. The work went through multiple editions and is today better known as Hume's Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, but the first title was Philosophical Essays, and the tenth essay in that collection is Of Miracles. That's the essay that will principally concern us here. After he died, in 1778, one of his friends published his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. That is a skeptical work that excites a good deal of interest even today. Um, many philosophers today, and this is a reason for taking Hume very seriously, think that Hume's writings are the high watermark of discussion in philosophy of religion. This is not an isolated viewpoint. There was a conference recently up in Grand Rapids where a fairly well-known philosopher had been giving his own position about the supernatural and Someone in the audience asked him a question about miracles, uh, and he cut the questioner off short by saying, read Hume. And the questioner said, well, I have read Hume, but, and the lecturer just said, then you need to read him again. So the appeal to Hume is often used as a conversation stopper in contemporary philosophical circles. Here's some background on Hume's thought, what he was like as a man. Just before his death in 1776, he wrote an autobiographical piece in which he speaks of the love of literary fame as, as he puts it, my ruling passion. You can imagine how much it would sting someone who loved literary fame to write a long book in 1739 and have the whole thing ignored. He did not wish to be known by the name Deist. Now, there, this is a delicate point. Does that mean he was not a deist? At a dinner party, a woman who identified herself as a deist came up to him, introduced herself, and shook his hand and said, I think we deists ought to know one another. To which Hume replied, Madame, I do not wish to be known by that name. Now notice the beautiful ambiguity in the statement. Did he not wish to be known by that name? because he didn't think it properly applied to him? Or did he not wish to be known by that name because being known by that name could have ramifications in polite society? Hume artfully chooses an expression that is ambiguous as between those. 
There's a funny story about his staying at a friend's house once. Uh, his friend got up in the morning to find Hume huddled at the far end of the kitchen, away from the fireplace. And his friend sort of looked at him, and Hume said, Take it away! Take away the enemy! His friend thought that he meant that the fire was too hot, and he said, Oh, do you, do you want me to bank it down? No, no, not the fire! And Hume pointed across the room to a large family Bible that was open on a reading stand. Um, no doubt Hume was having a bit of fun, but that's the turn that his mind took when he wanted to have a bit of fun. On a broader scale, he's now classified as a British empiricist in the tradition of which John Locke is the most notable earlier representative. A British empiricist of the concept empiricist variety, that is, the belief that there is nothing in the intellect that is not first in the senses. Now that expression, that there's nothing in the intellect that's not first in the senses, is actually just an English translation of a medieval saying. And we can trace this back to Aristotelian uh, empiricism of its own kind. But with Hume, as with Locke, it took a sharper turn. So the idea is that literally what the mind does is to take the inputs of sensation and to act upon them, combining them and dividing them, doing a sort of chemistry of the mind. Just as a chemist may put things together or may separate things out by various means, so the mind puts sensations together or divides components or aspects of sensation. So I might see a red ball and my mind may separate out the idea of redness and the idea of sphericity. So the color is one idea, the shape is another, the smoothness of the ball to touch might be a third, so I can separate out the components of something that's given to me all at once. George Berkeley, though an empiricist, did not like that separation theory and maintained that this whole doctrine of abstract ideas that you found in Locke was just a mistake. We never think of the abstract idea of triangle. We always think of a particular triangle. And if we try to do proofs with it and we're concerned that our proofs might end up proving something only about this particular triangle and not about all triangles, then there's an easy solution for it. All that we need to do is to make sure that in our reasoning we make use of no premises that refer to features of this triangle that are not features of all triangles without exception. So I may refer to the fact that the triangle has three angles or that it has three sides. That's something true of all triangles. If, however, I refer to the triangle as having an obtuse angle, an angle greater than 90 degrees, then my proof will be limited because it is not the case that all triangles must have at least one obtuse angle, that some triangles have and some triangles do not. In his final work, which he gave to a friend to be published if the friend thought it suitable after his death, uh, Hume takes aim at one of the early Boyle lecturers, Dr. Samuel Clark, uh, whose uh, being and attributes of God was a very famous work, not only of philosophical theology, but also of natural theology. Uh, in it, Clark gives the most sophisticated formulation perhaps ever seen until contemporary times of a cosmological argument, uh, one so intricate and interesting and carefully worked out that William Rowe, the contemporary analytic philosopher, though not himself uh, a believer in God, treats it extremely seriously. He's got an entire book on the cosmological argument where after briefly looking at some earlier formulations, he spends the bulk of his time analyzing Clark's version and concludes that it has very few premises that are open to objection and those may be given plausible defenses, though in the final analysis he's not sure that it's airtight. Um, interestingly, Clark's argument was also the subject of an analysis by the English logician George Boole, who invented a form of symbolic logic, not the form that we are now familiar with from Russell and Whitehead, but an earlier form. Boole chose to apply his symbolic logic to two specimens of argument. Clark's argument was one of them, and the other 
was Spinoza's uh, arguments uh, by a geometric method from his ethics. And Boole concluded that Spinoza is a hack and his arguments don't work and are just full of ambiguities and non sequiturs, but that Clark's argument is so tightly knit together Boole could find only one spot where he could complain that the conclusion didn't seem to him to follow from the premises. So Philo, who crit critiques Clark's arguments, um, as put forward by Cleanthes, is generally thought to represent Hume's own thought, though the way that Hume writes it, he says, well, he thinks Cleanthes is nearer to the truth, but that's just a persona that he's putting on. Most readers have taken it that Hume sincerely was as skeptical as Philo comes across, thinking that there are no good arguments for the existence of God, and we can know very little indeed about the creator of the universe, or whether indeed there were multiple creators of the universe. There's some famous history behind the essay of miracles, and I'm going to read you a paragraph here from a letter that David Hume wrote to his friend Hugh Blair. Blair was a dissenting minister and a friend of Alexander Campbell. George Campbell passed to Hugh Blair, a dissenting minister who was a friend of Hume, a copy of his manuscript of a dissertation on miracles. Hume then wrote back to Blair and gave him some responses to some of Campbell's arguments. In this note from June of 1762, he talks about the origin of his argument. Listen carefully to this. This is very interesting. It may perhaps amuse you to learn the first hint which suggested to me that argument which you have so strenuously attacked. I was walking in the cloisters of the Jesuits College of La Fleche. This is, by the way, the school where Descartes studied when he was young a town in which I passed two years of my youth, and engaged in a conversation with a Jesuit of some parts in learning, who was relating to me and urging some nonsensical miracle performed lately in their convent, when I was tempted to dispute against him, and as my head was full of the topics of my treatise of human nature, which I was at that time composing, this argument immediately occurred to me, and I thought it very much graveled my companion. But at last he observed to me that it was impossible for that argument to have any solidity because it operated equally against the gospel as the Catholic miracles, which observation I thought proper to admit as a sufficient answer. I hope that you can hear the irony in Hume's final line there. Why, yes, it would work equally well against the gospel, wouldn't it? And just leaving it there and moving on. That's quite characteristic, not only of the man, but of a certain kind of style, uh, of which Barclay gives a sharp delineation in his book, Alcafron. I want you to note two things in particular about this quotation. First of all, note that he says that it occurred to him as he was composing his treatise of human nature. That book was published in 1739. So this must put the date of the occurrence of the argument to him at least back a year or two from that, since it takes some time for a book to come out. So probably somewhat earlier than 1739, that is, while Hume was still in his 20s, this work, this argument, occurred to him, and yet he didn't publish it until 1748. He has another letter, this one to his cousin, Henry Holm, in which he says that he's preparing his treatise for publication, a process he describes as castrating the book. That is to say, cutting off its nobler parts. That is to say, endeavoring that it shall give as little offense as possible. Although we can't be certain, it does seem at least plausible that one of the things that he did was to remove the essay of miracles or some early precursor of it from the manuscript of his treatise. Of course, the purpose of the treatise was to secure human a post at an academic institution. Putting of miracles into the work would not have secured him that post. In the event, it didn't work anyway, but he was probably at that point still trying to get that sort of appointment. The second thing I want you to notice about this is that he refers to this 
argument, that argument which you have so strenuously attacked, this argument immediately occurred to me. Note the use of the singular. There appears to be one argument that Hume has in mind. Now what could that argument be? We'll see that there's actually an interpretive dispute regarding the structure and meaning of Hume's essay. So as we get to that, keep in mind that Hume refers in the singular to my argument, that argument, and so on, this argument. So what is the structure of the essay of miracles? It has two parts, that much is plain on the page. Traditionally, it's thought of as a primary argument in part one and a set of four secondary arguments in part two with some concluding remarks. But there have been recent interpretive disputes and there are at least three positions on the question about part one. Uh, first position, the argument of part one is transparently bad. This is John Ehrman's position in Hume's abject failure. Second position, the argument in part one is so muddled that it is impossible to tell what Hume was trying to say. This is David Johnson's position in his book, Hume, Holism and Miracles. And finally, there is no argument in part one, and it's a gross misreading of Hume to say that there was. This is the position of Robert Foglin in his book, A Defense of Hume on Miracles. One might think that it's a bit odd for there to be this much interpretive disagreement over an essay that is viewed as the high watermark of philosophical thinking on the subject of miracles. That is at least a bit puzzling. So let's see some of the evidence for interpreting him one way or the other. Here's some evidence for the traditional interpretation that there is an argument in part one. At the outset, Hume boasts that he has discovered an argument, he specifically refers to it in the singular, which will, at least with the wise and learned, be, quote, an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusion. It would appear that it would take some form of reasoning to provide the everlasting check. He characterizes what he intends to give us as decisive. Now, it's hard to see, again, how some mere preliminary thoughts could be decisive. He declares that it will last as long as the world endures, not a modest man, David Hume. And he concludes that no human testimony can have such force as to prove a miracle and make it a just foundation for any system of religion. All of these statements sound like the statements of a man who thinks he has given an argument, and a pretty good one at that. But there's more. Hume says, even if the testimony for a miracle amounted to a proof, a term that in Hume means roughly an argument we might take as conclusive if it were unopposed. It would be opposed by another proof from universal experience, one that is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined that would annihilate it. Again, this is very strong language and doesn't seem suitable for a description of mere preliminary conditions. So it suggests that even in the hypothetical best case, there would be nothing left of the case for miracles after the annihilation. Nevertheless, Robert Foglin has argued quite strenuously that all of this is a gross misreading of Hume and that Hume, in fact, had no such intention in part one. He grants that Hume makes arguments in part two, but in part one, that's not what Hume was doing at all. Hume ends part one with a famous maxim, if the falsehood of the testimony would be more miraculous than the event which the testifier relates, then and not till then can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. Foglin fastens on this and says, Look, this is conditional. All it says is if. It doesn't say that the falsehood would be more miraculous. So Hume isn't saying outright here that the antecedent can never be satisfied. He's simply setting the bar high. He's showing you that there's a very substantial presumption against miracle. 
Now, as we already saw, Hume characterizes what he's done as decisive. He says that it'll be an everlasting check, that it will last as long as the world endures. So, merely saying, well, maybe this is hard to satisfy, does not seem quite to live up to the measure of the strong rhetoric that Hume has used. But Foglin thinks that he can make another case for it. Hume says his qualification that testimony cannot prove a miracle is qualified in two ways. First of all, he's merely making a claim about the evidence that can, in fact, be adduced on behalf of miracles. Take note of what Fogelin says here. Hume's only talking about what, in fact, we have, not about what we might have. And he is restricting his claim to the case of reported miracles within a religious context. He's asserting only that they cannot provide the epistemic foundation for a religion. So two qualifications. Hume, according to Fogelin, is talking only about the evidence we in fact have. And he is talking only about miracle claims within the context of a religion, where the miracle is an attempt to found or ground the religion. Now, Fogelin can appeal to a proof text that comes up in the second part of Hume's essay. I'm going to quote Hume on this slide and the next so that we can look at Fogelin's principal proof text extensively. I beg the limitations here made may be remarked when I say that a miracle can never be proved so as to be the foundation of a system of religion. For I own that otherwise there may possibly be miracles or violations of the usual course of nature of such a kind as to admit of proof from human testimony, though perhaps it will be impossible to find any such in all the records of history. Well, that sounds like an admission that there could be miracles, though perhaps we won't actually find evidence of them. Thus suppose, he says, that all authors in all languages agree that from the 1st of January, 1600, there was a total darkness over the whole earth for eight days, all authors in all languages. Suppose that the tradition of this extraordinary event is still strong and lively among the people, that all travelers who return from foreign countries bring us accounts of the same tradition without the least variation or contradiction. Notice the strong demand there that there be not the least variation or contradiction. It is evident that our present philosophers, instead of doubting the fact, ought to receive it as certain and ought to search for the causes whence it might be derived. It would appear, then, that Hume not only is open to the possibility of miracles, but has here given us an example of the sort of thing he would actually take to be one. So, Fogelin says, this paragraph supports his reading that Hume is not offering a decisive argument against miracles in part one of his essay. But there are some problems with this. First of all, that closing reference to philosophers searching for the causes clearly means natural causes. That's how Hume uses the phrase elsewhere. And the philosophers are, of course, not armchair types. They are natural philosophers, what we would today call scientists. They are people who are looking for the purely natural causes of purely natural phenomena. So that choice of words warns the readers that Hume would consider the darkness to be not strictly a miracle, a violation of the laws of nature, just a violation of its usual course. And I don't know if you noticed, but that's how he describes it. He doesn't use the language of laws of nature. He uses the language of the usual course of nature. He goes on to note that the decay, corruption, and dissolution of nature is rendered so probable by many analogies that it comes within the reach of human testimony, if that testimony be very extensive and uniform. In other words, what started out as an instance of a miracle that could be believed on testimony turns out instead to be what Hume calls a marvel. It's not a miracle. It's not a violation of the laws of nature. It's a marvel. It's an unusual violation of the usual course of nature. So Hume has taken away with the left hand what he appeared to be conceding with the right. Fogelin, however, has one other proof text. 
he notes that in part two, Hume says something quite interesting. Here's how Fogelin introduces it. He says, it's a gross misreading to say that Hume maintains that no testimony could ever be sufficient to establish the occurrence of a miracle. Hume does not say this in part one. Indeed, Hume nowhere asserts this, though in part two, he does say, quote, upon the whole, it appears that no testimony for any kind of miracle has ever amounted to a probability, much less to a proof has ever amounted. Foglin italicizes the word has and drives it home to the reader that this is a very qualified statement. And that sounds like a reasonable argument until you pick up a copy of Hume's essay printed before the year 1768. Because it turns out that what Foglin is quoting is not the original wording of Hume's essay. The original wording of that paragraph reads, no testimony for any kind of miracle can ever possibly amount to a probability, much less to a proof. So if you would like to go to the library portion of the SDA website and have a look at the 1748 edition, you will find that this is the wording in the 35th paragraph rather than the wording that Foglin is quoting. That is wording which Foglin uh, is very fond of, but that comes up after Hume had seen Campbell's dissertation on miracles, and Campbell had pursued Hume quite relentlessly over this extraordinary claim that no testimony for any kind of miracle can ever possibly amount to a probability. Hume then changed the language, and in subsequent editions of the dissertation on miracles, Campbell noted that the language had been changed. He draws the reader's attention to this, and he says, I have therefore made some alterations in my argument to accommodate the fact that Hume has changed his language. So much for Fogelin's case for the idea that Hume is not giving an argument in part one. We saw some presumptive arguments for that. But there's some other kinds of arguments. Hume's interactions with his contemporaries strongly suggest that he did view this as an argument. So, for example, Philip Skelton wrote a book called Ophiomachus, or Deism Revealed. Uh, that's the very first piece that actually has a response to Hume's essay in 1749. In it, he attributes to Hume an argument that would license the rejection of any report of a miracle without examination of the quality of the testimony. Hume didn't challenge the interpretation, and that's significant because the publisher handed the manuscript of Skelton's book to Hume, and he said, what do you think of this? Hume took a couple of hours, looked through it, brought it back to the publisher, and said, publish it. So it was Hume's own recommendation that actually got Skelton's work published. That would seem at least somewhat odd if Hume's central argument, or his central approach in the first part of his essay, were being grossly misrepresented. Second, in a letter to Hugh Blair regarding Campbell's dissertation on miracles, Hume expresses various criticisms of Campbell's performance in a gentlemanly fashion. He does not complain about the fact that Campbell attributes this kind of argument to him, and Campbell does. So again, there, in a work where Hume was taking time and leisure to give his reactions and complaining in some places about Campbell's treatment of him, he does not complain that Campbell has misunderstood him that would have seemed to be a reasonable place to find such complaint if Hume did indeed have it. There's also a passage in what Hume wrote to Hugh Blair that is, I think, quite revealing. Uh, he says, Does a man of sense run after every silly tale of hobgoblins or fairies, and canvas particularly the evidence. I never knew anyone that examined and deliberated about nonsense who did not believe it before the end of his enquiries." A frank admission from Hume that does seem to lend color to the interpretation that Hume thought he could reject all stories of the supernatural without any examination of the evidence, and that is precisely the conclusion of the argument that has been attributed to him in part one. Well, where are we left if that really is an argument he's trying to make? We are left either saying it's a good argument, or saying it's a bad argument, or saying we can't even 
tell how the argument is supposed to go, though it appears he meant to have one. So those are the main interpretive options that are left. It's good, it's bad, or it's inscrutable because it's just too obscurely phrased. It's really very curious that whereas in the middle of the 20th century, people quite forthrightly appealed to Hume as having settled the matter and to Hume's argument from part one as being just uh, beyond criticism, now people who are trying to defend Hume are either denying that he has such an argument or admitting that it's a bad argument or just silently moving past it and focusing their attention on the four other considerations that he offers in the second part of his essay. So I think this is, quote, this quotation from Hume's letter to Hugh Blair does support the traditional interpretation of part one. With that in view, here's just a quick outline of Hume's essay in the traditional acceptation. First, part one gives an argument in principle that no miracle story can ever be credible no matter how well attested. That's part of the definition of a miracle. By definition, a miracle has a case against it so strong that that case cannot be overcome. Part two contains four arguments that particular miracle claims have never in fact been as well attested as they might have been. The first argument is that the witnesses are never sufficiently sensible, educated, sincere, and prestigious. The second is that human beings tend to set aside critical thinking when considering miracle reports. The third is that miracle stories tend to circulate among the ignorant and barbarous people rather than the well-educated and civilized, that is, people like Hume. And finally, every religion has miracle stories and prodigies, and therefore, miracle stories and prodigies are cross-canceling. Right? The Gilbert and Sullivan principle, if everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody. If every religion has miracles, then every religion has equally good support, and as every religion is incompatible with every other religion, there are a multitude of good reasons to deny any particular religion that you might care to take up and examine. Therefore, the whole thing's a wash, and we should just stop talking about miracles as a ground for religious belief altogether. On Monday and Wednesday of next week, we will look at some of the primary responses to Hume, and I wanted to just give you a very brief list from among the many, many responses Hume's essay generated of some of the ones of greatest interest. William Adams, an essay in answer to Mr. Hume's essay, on miracles. Uh, that went through several editions and the titles vary just slightly, but William Adams is a clear writer and an excellent place to go. Adams uh, is somebody that we will talk about more on Monday. George Campbell's dissertation on miracles, we have already had opportunity to refer to this. That is probably the most intellectually powerful response to Hume from someone who stood in the Scottish Common Sense School and was a friend of Thomas Reed. In fact, there is even a report that Hume admitted to some of his friends that the Scotch theologue had defeated him. Uh, I have that only from one source, so I'm not able to give you multiple confirmations, but that's a fascinating admission, although if it was made at all, it was made in private. John Douglas wrote a book entitled The Criterion, in which he attacks Hume vigorously. That's another major work, uh, particularly because Douglas fastens on the question of the fourth argument in part two of Hume's essay. And Douglas says, uh, let's actually develop some criteria to distinguish among reported miracles, reported miracle stories. His criteria are different from Leslie's criteria, but quite interesting in their own right. So this, is, this all makes good reading. And finally, William Paley, at the end of the 18th century, synthesized a lot of what had gone before. In his book, A View of the Evidences of Christianity, written in the 1790s, Paley sets aside his preliminary considerations. And in the preliminary considerations, he discusses Hume's prejudice and offers a thoughtful analysis of what goes wrong with Hume's prejudice. So we'll have some opportunity to talk about that as well.